problem is I get a lot of projects like to make packaging for food, fast food or snacks. And then I realize that I have to lie a lot and I'm not really happy with that. But I would fall asleep after eating constantly. Even at school, it plagued me for my entire school life. I would fall asleep after every meal. And basically, long story short, got done with the allopathic way of dealing with chronic disease. The parents, they would always say, if you couldn't finish your plate, finish the meat first, leave the rice, leave the vegetables, they're not important. Because that's what gives us the energy, is the, is the meat. We, we all know that. It seems that here, the, the people, they would rather finish the dessert or the rice than the meat. The meat is, it always comes last. Okay, welcome everybody. You've got with us uh, today, you go, Theo and Nicole. Is that your pronunciation, Theo, or is that right? Yeah. That's really good. Yeah, well done. They are all the way from France. And I was giving a little background. Theo says he's from Belgium originally, and Nicole is from Hong Kong. I guess share a little bit about yourselves. How did you guys meet? What do you guys do? And then we'll get into what was interesting to me is some of the, uh, one of the books you've written. So tell me a little bit about yourselves. Sure. Mm-hmm. Theo, Nicole, good pronunciation, by the way. And so I'm from Belgium, but I've lived most of my adult life in the UK, actually, in London. I was a professional musician before COVID. And so the really short story is Nicole moved to, where is it, Canterbury? Yes. In the UK to do her master's in anthropology. We met in the most 2020 way of meeting, which was through an app, basically. Mm-hmm. And Right before COVID. Yeah, right before COVID. And so basically we just exchange paragraphs and paragraphs and we just thought, let's meet at some point because it's not like it's right next door, but it's not too far off. So we met in London Mm -hmm. and not long after COVID hit. Mm -hmm. So that kind of kickstarted things to a point where we basically got locked down together for about six months. Mm-hmm. And so everything got accelerated to um, a point where we felt like we had a lot of affinities together. We were working quite well. We're seeing the world together. The good thing is we had the same view of what was happening in real time, which is not a luxury everybody had, mm-hmm. especially during that time. So we're still unsure where to go. For me, being a musician, I was in denial of letting go because it's a precarious gig, especially through COVID. But so I just decided it's probably time to go. And we're not sure what, yet what to do, but Nicole went to do some more studying in Belgium. And so we, that's where we are now. We are based in Belgium, France, and the UK because her father is still in the UK too. Mm-hmm. And Nicole is an anthropologist and a visual, artist. visual artist by trade. Mm-hmm. And I'm a musician. And on the side, I teach French one-to-one in full immersion here in Brittany. In my, with my father, actually, that's the family business. Oh, very nice. Very nice. And so you guys are, you, you're here in Brittany, so you're on the, on the Atlantic coast there, not far from Lord That's right. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. So, that's right. And Nicole, anthropology, what got you interested in anthropology? That's it. That's something I'm, well, I think is really cool. It's really interesting. What, what, what got you involved in that? So to begin with, I had, I have a official communication design degree. And so I became a designer. And then the problem is uh, I get a lot of projects like to make packaging for food, fast food or snacks. And then I realized that I have to lie a lot and I'm not really happy with that. If if I receive a brief and then the client said, I want uh, to have an appetizing looking design, I want appetizing looking colors, I want you to make it look like it's healthy, really good for the body, but it's not. But I can't really say no, but I, I just know how to do it because it's just arrangement of colors and then tight faces is really easy. But when a normal customer, when they see it, it's just, they just think, wow, this is good. This must be good for my body. And just, I feel like I'm lying to myself, lying to the other people. And I'm thinking, is there a way out of this? So I went to study in, in the UK to see we, we could get something out of this because Hong Kong is really commercial. It's a really commercial society. So um, I was looking for an alternative, basically. Okay. One thing, I, I'll just, because you, your family, you're from, originally from Hong Kong, and I often use Hong Kong as an example of a place where people seem to eat a lot of meat, at least that's what the data that I've seen supports. Uh-huh. And obviously, we'll talk a little bit about eating on this uh, thing. You guys wrote a book 
that is a children's book that is designed to encourage kids to they say eat more meats. That's unusual, right? There it is. What's it called? Our species appropriate diet, Tiger's Mystery in Lion Land. How did mm -hmm. you guys decide to do that? Where did that come from? It stems from several things. Is so to me. I, maybe we can speak about this later, although I don't know how interesting that is. But basically, it all stems from my own journey of dealing with chronic issues and all of that things. Because when I moved to Brittany, I was hit by a slew of allergies and then started having bad asthma and then chronic fatigue and a lot of problems. I was always a very active kid, but I would fall asleep after eating constantly. Even at school, it plagued me for my entire school life. I would fall asleep after every meal. And basically, long story short, I got done with the allopathic way of dealing with chronic disease because I gained a lot of weight with cortisones and all of those things were, and bad advice when I was a teenager. And so I started looking more into the alternate space and all of those things. And then I was thinking at some point I've stumbled on a lot of things that are quite interesting. And a lot of things in this world, there's a lot of specialists, but there's nothing really synthesizing everything. And a lot of the things we see, especially in the carnivore sphere, it's a lot of people in around the middle ages that are healing and all of that, which is phenomenal, but there's nothing really to move on to the next step. And so I had an idea of doing a book uh, about a slew of different things. And then one day Nicole had this Eureka moment watching and she'll tell that story. Uh -huh. But basically one day she thought, why don't we just make a book for kids? And she'll explain why, because we want to have kids. And my view was just, we need to prepare now because we're against such a machine, an establishment that misinforms us on a daily basis, whether it's for food or anything else. And they're so well prepared. In France, for example, uh, I don't know if you're aware, but they just made it close to impossible to homeschool your children. Meaning, Germany, they are going Germany to has a similar policy where you're not allowed to homeschool your kids in Germany. I know that, but I didn't know if right. anything's going down there. Right. Yeah. The country of the Enlightenment, by the way. <laughs> so. You, you can't homeschool unless there are prodigies or disabled to an extreme amount, to an extreme degree or something. You virtually can't do it if your child is anywhere close to normal. And they will be prepared. They will have material. They will teach them all of the things that we have, that we had to deal with and get out of. And we don't really have anything to fight that. We're not really prepared. So to me, it was mostly it. the COVID thing was a first, as I say, first trigger is that we don't know how to we don't know how to be organized and we don't know how to how to go to the next step yes there's an outcry it's great to say how i got healed and everything but it would be nice now to share it so the next generation has something to a healthier basis to start from yeah and should, since it, we want to have kids we thought that's the best way is to actually start with us and then share that. And so Nicole will probably explain the story on how she got the, the light bulb. Yeah, for Nicole, because you said your job had been sometimes designing stuff that was almost deceptive in a way. It's just like making yeah. my product if you feel good, look good. People are encouraged to buy it, even though it may be to their detriment. And I, I can see where you feel guilt over mm -hmm. doing that. Now. But hey, let, let's talk about how you started to come up with this. I'll start with a story. I had this Eureka moment when I went to Theo Scottson's birthday party. And then I realized everything on the table was just cakes. You can't even find a piece of ham or a sausage or just cakes. And then at night, the little boy was eating uh, a bowl of uh, vegetable soup with a piece of bread and a really small piece of ham. And he was three year old and then i was like this is so bad I, I would never see this in hong kong and then the mother what she did in, in the afternoon was she ordered a, a piece of chicken thigh mm -hmm. and then she didn't finish it she asked the wait waitress to collect it to uh, throw it in the bin basically and then so she can have a dessert a big one and then I was, again, I couldn't believe my eyes. I would never see this in Hong Kong. Meaning meaning she stopped eating her main meal with meat on it just so she could have some room left for the dessert. For the dessert, yeah. yes. And so I was thinking, wow, this is so bad. You're wasting food and you are not energetic. You, you are tired, you're sick all the time. And the worst thing is that your boy is learning from you. So he's going to behave the same in the future. And 
one thing in the Hong Kong culture is that when when I was a kid or when we were kids, the parents they would always say, if you couldn't finish your plate, finish the meat first. Leave the rice, leave the vegetables. They're not important because that's what uh, gives us the energy. Is the is the meat? We we all know that. But it seems that here, if the people they would rather finish the dessert or the rice or the grains and vegetables than the meat. The meat is it always comes last. And so, at least in this kind of middle class environment, yeah. And so I was thinking, if we have a kid, and then he's gonna be questioned all the time. So why are you eating meat a lot? Why don't you eat the cakes with us? And I want him to、uh, be able to explain to others why is he eating meat, why we should be more meat based, and why meat is okay. And so that's why I made this. So this is basically. Because speak to the mic.、Mm-hmm. I'll hold it. Okay.、Mm-hmm. So because a tiger is a typical Asian animal, and the lion is a typical European symbol, so that's it. Basically, my story. So the tiger is me, and so I went to Lion Land. I realized that the lions are eating plants and desserts, and I'm really worried because I want to settle in there. And we are carnivores. I don't think they are different from us, so we should eat meat. And then in the book, they will find out why they are eating plants, and can we remind the lions of their roots and、uh, restore their health? Yeah, and basically, it was actually quite intelligent how we're not strangers to that sphere. We've listened to you. We've listened to a lot of a lot of the usual suspects, and and we've metabolized a lot of these elements. And also, we happen to live in Brittany, which is one of the worst offenders in conventional agriculture in France. And we used to hearing all of these arguments. It's bad for the planet. It's bad for the bad for this and all of that. And so we basically put a little story together. Mostly Nicole, I, I added more of the of the elements of how do you call it, like the kernels, and then Nicole put all of this together. But we basically start by showing how the lions, for example, the mother she used to climb, but now she has arthritis. The little kid has allergies or is sleeping all the time, which was me. There's and we try and tackle all of these mainstream narratives in a way that is totally non-inflammatory. We're not trying to say plants trying to kill you, <laughs> but we're still trying to bring back the paradigm towards the fact that we have evolved on meat. We have the physiology of a carnivore. Eating meat is not bad for the planet. If anything, for example. I'll show you here. One of the example is here, where we show the difference in the physiology of a carnivore as opposed to that of a herbivore.、Mm-hmm. We explain also for the agriculture how animals is actually good for the soil and how it's important for the quality of the land, and how monocrop agriculture is also something that is quite destructive for the biotopes and kills a lot of animals too with the harvests and everything. So we don't try and as you say it, it's not it's really not an inflammatory book, but it's just something that's trying to bring back a bit of a a bit of a how do you say a bit of sense in all of this. We mention also the、uh, carbon isotopes that it was actually I was surprised that they talked about it in mainstream not long ago here that they had found Neanderthal tooth that they had done carbon isotope testing on and that they had found that they were just eating b- bone marrow, meat, and blood. So we mentioned this as well. So we we try to make a whole story that combines all truth together to make a story, and that you're not mean for eating meat. Of course, something you should respect. Meat is good for the land. Your physiology is that of a is closer that of a carnivore than that of a herbivore. You don't have a rumen. You don't have a functioning cecum, and so it's just trying to piece all of that together.、Mm-hmm. And there's also a fun bit in it. Which of course is more for adults that kind of see things as they are. As a, there's a ploy. It's desired for lion to eat greens. There's a whole idea for them to eat greens, and there's a kind of a guy behind all of this. Yeah, that's a story. In the story. The- it's、uh, so there's an antagonist. So there's so many stories. There's there's so many trying to trick the lion into. Exactly. Know, yeah. 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 There's <laughs> a reason why he's tricking the lions into eating greens and having slow lions. Yeah. So it's a fun book. What age is the target age for this? What do you say? That is the million-dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is, that's something that has plagued us for a long time. Is we don't really, we just, 
we have this great idea that we would have loved as kids, but I don't know how that translates into the market. However, we just really had it. We really had in mind that this would be material for a parent to read it to the child, and so mm -hmm. it's really it's not dumbed down by any means. It's also entertaining to read for an adult, especially for those that are not sure, that are not really aware. Like my parents, for example find it highly entertaining because it doesn't speak down to them. It doesn't speak to them like they're idiots. It's very neutral and it, and it paints a picture that is, as I said, I'm quite surprised how we managed with all the inflammation that we have against that system, we managed to be extremely anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. and quite warm and to the point where we were trying to say in the book. And so yeah, to me, I would say when the child starts being surrounded by other kids, maybe three, four or five, like my godson, for example, I had to explain the last holidays we had with the godson. I had to explain what the concept of death was. So he understands what happens when he served meat and how this is also something he should respect because he has no idea where it comes from. And so I would say it's probably between three to seven plus, which is the pivotal age when they start going to school and all that thing, all, all of these things start being in the environment that's when you should say look this thing is delicious but it's not the best thing for you to have right. it's not something you should be rewarded with all the time as soon as you're slightly annoying mm -hmm. okay fair enough and this book's been published i guess it is people purchased it and you can get feedback on how it's been used so far we've had <clears throat> so we've had mostly a feedback from our relatives so basically we we don't really have contacts in the editing world in the publishing world so we decided to self-publish we got in touch with some people in this in the carnivore sphere with no return. So at some point we were just like, we have this idea, let's try and throw it in the open and see what and give it a life of its own. Mm -hmm. So we self-published on Amazon. So far we have sold so it's been on for about three months. Mm -hmm. About something about like that. Three months, yes. About three months. So the first two months, nothing happened much because we just basically laid the work there. and Yeah, and it was Christmas, so we were quite busy. Yeah, it was Christmas. But then Nicole made an Instagram mm -hmm. that she's keeping, that she's trying to, yeah. to, to, she's trying to grow it. Mm -hmm. And so we sold a few to people we don't know. Mm -hmm. Not a huge amount, but a few. And the feedback we've had so far is on Amazon and it's very positive. Thingy. But we haven't had, it's very young, we haven't had a lot of feedback yet. And obviously, have, sorry, we have had the usual trolls on on Instagram trying to explain how what we're doing is uh, ah, yeah, yes, uh, really bad, but I don't think they've read the book. <laughs> there, are, there are plenty of, you know, plant-based books for kids out there now. I know that the vegans yeah. have been very, very uh, organized in doing that, so that's out there. Exactly. So we, yeah. It's almost like no. we have these kids who are being indoctrinated into this. Like you said, the line being made slowed in a similar way. And, as we get, and I agree 100%. You have to. I have four children, and my kids eat meat. It's a lot of meat. And they're not How dare you? Strict hard work, but they, <laughs> they definitely know the value of meat and why you eat meat and understand that, that we don't waste it either. Like, like you said, it's, to me, it's awful to, to waste meat because you think about it, there is an animal's life that, that was involved in that process and let me just i want to go back to nicole because you had mentioned like you said in hong kong if a kid is eating he's told finish up your meat first and if you don't eat the stuff whereas someplace in the u.s where they take two or three bites of their meat and then they say we're for dessert like that they're trained the food that they're going to get if they if they show i don't eat this i still get dessert and that's that's something that there's a little thing for if you don't eat your meat type of thing from the wall so i'm gonna, um, but anyway, it's, it is crazy how the, 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 the children's died, particularly today, and we're getting, and it's becoming worse and worse. And we've seen child obesity rates in the United States approaching, passing 12%, and mm -hmm. the diet is 70% off the thought process, and being worse, and my goodness, it's all in a bad place. So they, what you're doing is very important because we do need to teach kids this stuff. And if you have a, a way to do that, uh, you know, is that the level one? So that's a great thing. Uh, did you, I guess some of your visual, is that, did you illustrate it yourself or how did, how did yeah, that work? Yeah. I, I did it, everything by hand. So I've actually, have uh, all of the tools here. So it's a multimedia illustration. That's alcohol marker <laughs> and then color pencils and then water marker, etc. So yeah, everything is by hand, not digital and not AI. 
It's just me. Nothing AI. Everything yeah. analog, the good old ways. <laughs> and so, and then, of course, obviously, you take it and have it printed and you're great, so you don't have to. It's great illustration. Now you're a great artist. That's amazing. So, yeah, that's well. There you and go. And stuff like that. That's, how many pages is that? Uh, is that what? Okay. It's, it's around. So, basically, Nicole did all of the, that's the usual way we work because we've done these kind of things before, but not in the book. So, Nicole illustrates, mm -hmm. I scan, I clean everything up, I make everything ready for how to funnel into the uh, actual software she's going to uh, edit with. Mm -hmm. And for the page counts, it's 46. Okay, so it's a good, decent sized kids book. And do yep. you guys have any, if this book does well, which hopefully it will, is there plans for like further books in this sort of genre? Yeah. You bet. Yeah, I, I yes. have some ideas already. Yeah, we have some ideas. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is it the same line in Tiger or will be different characters? I guess there's other characters in the book besides the line in the Tiger, or is it just a Jada? Uh, I yeah. am. There's the antagonist. No, there, there, there's <laughs> some, some other animals as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. other animals. The wolf. Ma the main animals, let's say, the there's the two, Lionard, Lionard and Tigret. Uh -huh. And then there's the antagonist. And yes, the couple of extras. But yeah, there, you bet we have more in store. Mm -hmm. We... Of course, now we've not started because we have more, because ideas are great, but putting them in a nice, neat way is the mm. most of the job, actually. Yeah. But yeah, and it would be very much in the same vein, not specifically carnivore, for example, but more in the, in the line of, how do you say, being, uh, being aware of everything that they say, for example, uh, I'll give you just an example because it's not set in, set in stone, but you, you see how they blame genetics for pretty much anything under the sun. And they always have a, an easy solution for your problem which is a pill or something that generates profit. Mm -hmm. And I would like to get to a point where it were to also find a story where it's easy to show where a conflict of interest arises in a system where there's an answer that might be logical. And for some reason, for some illogical reason, that's not the, that's not what we're doing. Things like that's, um, whether it's the medical and uh, whether it's the pharmaceutical, whether it's a uh, big agriculture, which here is subsidized by the European Union to actually produce shit, let's call it what it is. And, and they basically paid to carry on this type of thing. So it's, as I said, we don't know exactly how to tackle things, but it would be in the same vein, trying to go back to, to sense how we've evolved, what makes sense in a holistic view. Not saying we have the answer, but just more bringing same thing we did here. We're not saying that you should not eat a single plant. Mm -hmm. We're not saying that meat is the answer to everything. We're just saying that we've gone astray to what has made sense for a long time. Yes. And so that's what we want. We will, we would like to achieve and the rest parents can also add their two cents on it. Mm -hmm. but my view is our genes have evolved under a certain pressure. And if you put them in an environment for which they have, are not adapted, you're going to see problem arise. And so mm -hmm. that approach can be taken for so many things other than just uh, metabolism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, our, our food supply is definitely evolved at a much faster pace than we found, we found later compensate for. Yeah, um, there's that's a question much. about the, the name of the book again. How, to, how would someone order this book? How would they go about it? Like they're in the US or something like that. How would they do this on Amazon? That's the thing. It's been a long, it's been a long journey to try and find the name. And we've had some feedback. Some said it's a mouthful. They may be right. <laughs> but the thing is, we're not going to call it Carnivore Book for Kids either. Yeah. Although I think if you type it, it will come at some point because there are some tags. Mm -hmm. But we had noticed within the sphere of, of a few carnivore communities that species appropriate diet had become a key word of the, or a synonym of the carnivore diet. I don't know if you're aware. Yeah, yeah. But that's something that has come up a lot of time. And these are people that we, that we also try to get in touch with that name to see uh, how, what they would think of that. And so the point is we really wanted to have a fun story to link all of that together and get people by subterfuge, especially the adults that might not really be open to the idea. Mm -hmm. This is not saying carnivore, get ready. It's not saying Mormon or Jehovah witness. <laughs> it's saying, oh, what is this? They open and they might get into the story and by subterfuge actually learn something mm. or get information. So it maybe isn't the best title for someone to randomly find it, but at the same time, we were being honest in trying to target that specific audience, which is us or the people in that sphere that go by 
a species of appropriate diet and try and see if that works. Mm. Yeah, I would imagine probably the target demographic initially is going to be blue or any farm or maybe want to give it to their grandkids or their nephew or all your own children or something. Exactly. So yes. most people will already be on board with a more fun every style yep. and, that, and as you probably know, that community is growing and growing. Uh, we have noticed. I think every day there are more and more. People discovering <laughs> the benefits and uh, you know, every day, I, I don't every see day that slowing day. down. You know? so, yeah, that, just from my perspective, I'll be back in France in August. I'm going to go back there. I've got a little, my, my, like I said, my, my wife is from there. So we always, she tries to go back once or twice a year. I usually try to make a little trip over there with them. And it was interesting just to hear some of the impossible homeschool or nearly impossible homeschool. France is better than the U.S. in that they don't allow for drug advertising on TV. If you do see, junk food on the television it usually comes with a warning at least time last time i was there i remember seeing some little warning on the tv this food is not particularly good for you or something along those lines and what they see- most think will be do exercise or eat five fruit and veg a day that's what they'll say most of the time yeah sure i get that and um they will often they had they just sort of the cantinas in the school where they feed the kids it tends to be better quality food than when you can in the U.S. where it's a lot of old. Maybe it is. I don't know if it's sold out. I think, to be honest, I don't know what we're comparing because maybe it's absolute trash in the U.S. because I've, ne- I've never tried it. But it's not that great either in France. It might be better than the U.S. or the U.K. because I've seen the U.K. and, the, and it can be dreadful. And it shows because a lot of them, a lot of the kids are very fat. <laughs> but uh, in France... I was in, in, we don't really have the private schools like in the US or the UK here. It's either you go public or you go private on the contract. And so it doesn't cost a fortune, but it costs a bit more than the free school system, basically. Mm-hmm. Something in the order of 3000 a year or something, but they tend to be Catholic schools. Mm-hmm. So I, I've been to Catholic school and boarding school as well. And the average thing was bread that you could bend. That was uh, like reheated bread. It was very white. Pizza sometimes with uh, potatoes on, or pasta sometimes, or cordon bleu with with green beans. It would not be complete trash, but by nowhere, by no nowhere stretch of the imagination, it's healthy. Even in the idea of a balanced diet that they sell you, it's not really great quality. So, Nicole, now you, did you grow up in Hong Kong? Is that what I'm here? I know you said you live in the UK, but did you, did you originally grew up in Hong Kong, correct? Yes, uh, I was born and raised in Hong Kong. I've uh, lived there for 25 years. Oh, so quite a while. So I'm still on. <laughs> <Yeah. there. laughs> and, and so the diet, when you read the statistics of Hong Kong, they consume a lot of meat, probably a lot of, a lot of pork, maybe a lot of seafood. What was the diet as you grew up as a kid and then maybe an adult? Was it very heavily a lot of meat in the diet or what was it like? So I would have to say, when I told my family and friends that, oh, it seems that we consume the most meat in the world, and they didn't believe me, because we thought we were taking the bare minimum to sustain our lives. We don't think we're eating a lot. We, we thought the Americans eat more, way more meat than us. We just couldn't believe this. And so yes, from my observation, yes, we do eat way more meat than people in Europe or in the U.S., so it comes from quite a few elements in our traditional diet. So first is that um, in every family, the mother, she would prepare bone broth or meat broth every day. It's a symbol of love. So it's a staple of the meal. If there's no bone broth, it's not a meal. That's basically what you get. And if a son is working really late and then he would be like, oh, I miss my uh, mother's bone broth. So that's that. And another thing is that we have a really strong roasting culture. I would say we have a lot of roast houses. We have maybe one each every five meters away, and five, 500 meters or 50 meters, really a lot. And in these places, they serve roast pork, and duck and chicken, all of that. And for beef, we have another specialized restaurant that's called the uh, Ngao Zap. That means uh, beef organ. So that's mostly for the men. They go there and then they order a beef organ, like a big bowl of that, and then they eat. Or sometimes they eat with noodles if they have a smaller budget. And it's funny because we, so we have our local fast food restaurants, and that's not the uh, international ones. It's just the local ones. And in our fast food restaurants, they don't serve burgers. So they have two departments. The first one is the Rose House. 
So there you can find a uh, roast pork and duck and things like that. In the other one, it's a steakhouse. So either you go the uh, European style of meat or the uh, Cantonese style of meat, but you get meat everywhere. And the thing is, it's because when I say, when I tell <clears throat> other people, we all, we all need meat, and then the people would be like, yeah, only if you are, maybe you're a construction worker, you are a man, you have to grow your muscles and you need meat. And then I would be like, no, because I was an office lady and I've seen so many other office ladies eating the same thing. And they all behave the same way. They leave the rice when they couldn't finish, they finish the meat first. I think that's because if you don't do that, you, you can't really survive in a really harsh or competitive workplace environment. It's like in Hong Kong, we if we get a complaint from a customer and then you get a warning letter and then after two warning letters, you're fired. And no buffer for that. And it's really harsh because... In my generation, everyone is uh, at least a uh, trilingual. So if you are an office lady, you have to prepare to switch your language when you pick up your phone when you couldn't do it and your client is angry and then, boom, another warning letter maybe. So you have to be quick. Not just the muscles, but the, the brain muscles, I, I would put it this way. And then what I've noticed is that the people in the West, they're really well protected. It's a good thing. It's a very good thing that they're so well protected. And they're happy, they're not as stressed as we are, which is really good. And But the thing is, that gives them a reason not to really push, their, push the envelope. They don't really try hard with their brains or they don't really try hard with their bodies. They just let it be because if the customer is angry, there's no consequences. Or if you are make, making mistakes, there's no consequences. Yeah, who are you, customer? Get away from my shop, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think it's funny because when I was a designer, and then I get other jobs as well, other than the job of a designer. They would be like, yeah. okay, Nicole, can you typeset this, please? Okay, I did. And then they would say, can you proofread it, please? Okay, I did. And then they would give me another document, and they would be like, can you proofread this, please? But it's in uh, Japanese. Okay, I'll do it. And then... Another one, give me another menu, is in French. Okay, I don't know French, but I'll try to do it. I don't know. And so, yeah, you have to improvise because if you can't improvise, there's always someone else who can replace you, who can really improvise really well because that's our culture. Hong Kong and Macau, we've been uh, trading pots for a very long time because we are Cantonese regions. And so we, we have to talk to Many other people with to talk to foreigners for a thousand years. And so it's deep rooted in our culture that we have to improvise all the time. And if you don't have enough meat, it's just impossible. If you just get tired all the time, you get this brain fog. And then, and then you just stare at the other guy and then hoping that you, he will forgive you for your snowless or for your errors. But it just doesn't happen. If it's, you either take it or leave it, the opportunity. Yeah. I it's interesting that you describe how competitive it is to live in Hong Kong. And you know, like you said, you either succeed or you, you fail. And there's no sort of propping up. And you mentioned Macau, which is another region which eats a lot of meat. They're like Hong Kong and Macau both eat tremendous amounts of meat. They both have extremely low life expectancies, number one and number two in the world from what I saw recently. And then, of course, you see very high intelligence questions. Hong Kong has more, I think, IQ on average of 110 or something like that. It's interesting how you point out that the standards are lower maybe in Europe and the United States and <sighs> maybe we need, it needs to be because our diet is so erratic and we couldn't handle it. And I, what I have seen and I've seen reported to me over and over again that people when they go carnival or mostly meat based, that their cognitive capacity improves significantly. They aren't as brain fogged or confused and they have <laughs> better, you know, just better insight and better ability to function, which is but interesting to think about it, you know, when we sit there and we start out with our kids who are developing, and this is really scary because, you know, you think about a, a newborn, a, a, you know, baby in utero and an infant, toddler kid, and you're feeding him or her just kind of garbage and their brain is needs this stuff. It's so important it, that they it's, it's, age. it's funny you mentioned that because that's really an epiphany I've had with, with my godson again. We went to, to a family holiday with, with him. Mm -hmm. And I was just completely stunned to see that he was constantly receiving some sort of sugar at some point, like a small biscuit, 
or he finished he did you didn't finish eating your bowl of pasta here's an ice cream or or oh you know what i'm gonna give him an ice cream because he didn't even ask for one and i'm so proud he didn't ask for an ice cream <laughs> i'm gonna give him an ice cream and the thing is to my mind is this is this releases dopamine constantly this cannot be healthy for the for the brain development to constantly being in a shower reward for having done nothing but something normal it cannot be it cannot be good for the development of the child and and that's what we we see left and right it's constant sugar of course the parents are addicted because this shit is addictive for sure you're bored or you're, you're a bit down it's an easy fix but they transfer all of that to the kids and i don't know how much that contributes to lack of we see and <clears throat> i can sympathize because i've had troubles with that too but mm -hmm. People having kids having a really hard time focusing on things that they don't find interesting. Uh, one way you could say that's maybe fair, fair game because they're kids and they should be playing outside and mm -hmm. hurting themselves, but then sitting all day in front of, of a blackboard. But on the other hand, it's, it's difficult to compete because they've had their entire childhood having rewards. The parents were not understanding me calling this rewards because they don't understand the mechanics of it. But at the end of the day, he's feeling a reward sensation by eating that sugar or getting that thing. And it cannot be healthy long-term for a developing brain. And that's what I was, what I was thinking. Also, I think it'd be important for Nicole to explain the anecdote on why Hong Kongers, we used to have this with the, I would imagine maybe the Judeo-Christian principles, but why Hong Kongers cannot conceive not to finish the meat or respect what's in your plate. Ah, okay. I think that's also something that could be interesting for you regarding the Hong Kong cult culture and view of the matter. Yeah, because it, it comes from this. So there's, we have to study really old poems. So that's like poems from 3,000 years ago or maybe a bit even older. So that's one we have to study in the maybe age of six or seven. And it talks about how a farmer is uh, dripping his uh, sweat onto this the soil and then the sun is uh, shining really brutally and it, every single bit of the meal is uh, hard work, it's hardship. So uh, we, we learned that poem when we were like uh, six or seven and then we, we feel the pressure. We don't finish something or we are wasting food, we feel that. So it's imprinted in the, how do I say, in the mentality or in the principle. It's just, yeah, don't waste food. We, we don't waste food. Oh, yeah. that's a priority. Yeah, it's a, it is. It, it, you think about all the effort that goes into producing food. Most people have no idea. Again, of course, we industrialize and automated and make so many things in factories where that initial sweat from the farm well, is, is maybe left out a little bit, but it, still, it's uh, traditionally food has been very hard to come by. People just didn't have enough. It would say you certainly wouldn't want to waste even a morsel of food when there's nothing left to look like. Mm -hmm. I keep getting questions about. Can they order direct from you guys or is it all by, by Amazon? It's a big part. They want to order in bulk now. Is there a way to facilitate that? Yes, there is a way to, to order in bulk. They need to get in touch with me. So the way we've done that for now is we have a personal website that mm -hmm. where we did consulting for uh, small businesses here in France and graphic design, mm -hmm. which is theo-nicole.com. Mm -hmm. And so the address is info at theo nicolecom mm -hmm. And so basically, as I said, now we are mainly using Kindle Direct Publishing. So that's Amazon. Because as I said, we did not have the contact, nor did we get the answers from the people. So we just decided, let's throw it so it lives and then we see what we do after. So for your average consumer, I would say the easiest is to go. So either on, an inst on our Instagram, there is a drop down of all the main countries that sell it. Mm -hmm. Or you can type our species appropriate diet on Amazon.com, for example. It should be there. With and for the bulk order, I can do it with the author's copies basically through the through the, the Kindle services of that country if people want to buy it in bulk. Mm. What is your Instagram account called? It's called It's quite long, it's quite a mouthful. <laughs> it is also a mouthful, believe it or not. It's called Tigrets and Lionite's Tail. <laughs> Tigrets and lionettes. <laughs> yeah, I see it there. Tigrets. Uh, lionettes. Is that going to work? There's no work. Lion. Leonard tails. Yeah. 
They are still yeah, out there. They're good. Yeah, and the pictures of a little bit of pictures from the book and some of the other stuff. Yeah, yeah. Three yeah and we had chicks recently. Nicole has done some little because we would like to get to a point where we could homestead a bit. It's a bit. It's very early on, but we have chickens and so mm. all the time. Yeah. Oh, here in so that's at your home in France. Yeah, very nice. So this is my parents' home. I'm renovating some ruins right next to it because you. I don't know. Have you ever been to Brittany? I'm not, I'm not. I know roughly where it is. I'm not there. We need to fix that next <laughs> time you're at your Where is it? What is the uh, Chateau Saint Michel? I think there's a lot that comes somewhere. Is any written here? Yeah. It? So I could get some fire for this. I think it's in Normandy, mm -hmm. but okay. it's right on the, it on could border. be Brittany. It's, it's, it's right on the border, on the Fontaine. Ah. Yeah, you. Yeah, hey, you, okay. you got some chops, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's about an hour and 10 minutes away from where we live. Oh, very good. I hear that's quite so, beautiful to see. I know. That is very beautiful. I'd yeah, encourage yeah. you to uh, to go and check it out on your way back after coming <laughs> to visit here. The so basically in Brittany the houses are granite, and it's the typical house is called longere, as in like elongated. Yeah. You could translate yeah. that literally, and so that's the way it used to be. They made out of granite and mud, and they would have one house for the family, and right next to it a house for the animals, and right next to it a house where they would get the milk. And so basically now a lot of houses, including this one, are just house, three houses glued together. And to these houses are attached another two houses that are ruins. And I'm re renovating this to, for, in order for us at some point to uh, move in together, to move in together over there. And uh, the plan also being to stay close to the parents, because I see the faith that our society uh, has in store for the elderly. I don't think that's very good for them, nor is it good for their grandkids. Yeah, it may be back to Hong Kong because I would imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, but how are the elderly treated in Hong Kong? Is it, are they brought into the family, revered? What is, because there is certain longevity there. It, it seems like having a sense of purpose after you may retire from your, from your job is an important thing to, to extend longevity. Is that something that you see in Hong Kong? Unfortunately, I think not really. I've, I've seen quite a lot of people who are old and co who are quite sad, but they just hang on for some reason. But um, there, there are positive examples, like my grandma, for example, he, she's uh, 90 and she's cooking for everyone every day and she's really healthy. And she it, it's a bit funny because so I have a cousin and her his mom doesn't know how to cook. So it was my grandma who cooks for him. And my grandma was already like 85 or something. So imagine that. And then that way you get a really healthy person. I'm not saying that's very good to the elderly people. I think the mom should definitely learn to cook. And But uh, yes, I would say because you see the people from my grandma's generation, for example, they have uh, experienced war, they couldn't finish school. And uh, now they have a roof on top, they have a uh, heating in the house and they have everything. So they want to cherish what they have. And they don't throw their life away like this. Yeah. And, and so, she probably wouldn't be that healthy if she didn't have to cook every day. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Not, yeah. yeah. Having, being forced to be able to do stuff is, is actually important in a way. You said you're renovating ruins. How old are the structures there? Are they, when you say ruins, that makes me think hundreds of years old, but how old are they? Uh, yeah. To give you a, an idea, this house that we're in right now is 150 years old. The house in the middle is 350 years old, and I think the ruins that we that I'm renovating, probably in the 150 for one and 250 for the other. And so <clears throat> the only thing I've got basically is walls, and the rest I have to do everything. So roof, new openings, new windows, and everything. My understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think if you're if, if there's a an older building and you're required to build it in a way that matches you have to have it in a very similar style you can't just make everything modern you have to do it the way it was done that is, is that is that the case that is mostly correct however it is dependent on the region you're in and the uh, the prefecture so basically every so every what do you call it commune so mm -hmm. that's the town hall yeah. with the elected guys and stuff they have an urbanism plan that's what it's called and they decide what is doable and not doable within certain criteria. So for example, in F Brittany, if you're in agricultural land, you will never ever get a permit to construct anything. Not possible. You can only renovate. However, if you in, uh, if I just go a mile to the village, you'll see 
close to whatever you want because they can get a construction permit and it can be mostly modern. So it depends really where you're at. But if you're dealing with a stone house, you need to basically ask for a permit to renovate it and you need to provide the, the renovation plans to say what you're going to use. And it's not like they're going to veto, but still a due process you have to do. You have to get approval for that, basically. Mm. Yeah, and I guess my understanding is, particularly if you're doing it in the, with some of these older ones when you're renovating these special things for contractors that know how to you have the skills to be the stuff that becomes more expensive in some ways. And of course, know, because my, my, my spouse keeps talking about maybe at one point moving back to back home in France and buying something and looking at all of, all of the facilities, but I'll mess with that and stuff grow with that. It's not impossible. In France, there's a lot of savoir-faire know-how. Yeah. So for example, my Mason is, is two years younger than me and most of his experience is with stones because he likes stones. He likes granites more than wind breeze. No, cinder blocks, I think you call them. Mm -hmm. So he prefers dealing with old and renovating that than just building a new house because that's boring to him. And he's younger than me in all of his experiences dealing with old houses. So it's not more expensive to get him than someone else. What is expensive is getting the architect and having everything done with the key in your hand, basically. That is the expensive bit. And also, for example, COVID really aggravated the situation with the slates because these houses tend to use slates for roofing. And even though there's, what do you call them, uh, kist quarries everywhere in, in France, we buy them from Spain for some reason. And it's about a euro, eight, uh, a euro 10 with before tax for one. So you do the math, I've got 240 square liters of roofing. I ain't going to be using slates. <laughs> it gets expensive. Pretty it gets crazy expensive, expensive yeah. Maybe don't do a thatch roof for it. I thought that was down or something like that. You see some, 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 what is some, in the North, some people still use straw, uh, straw roofing. Like it's not complete, like in Belgium, there are still quite a few. It's hard to get a Thatcher, but it is doable. Yeah. It's also like in the UK, actually, it was interesting. Some of the very old listeners, but let me, I, I guess not to give away the ending of the book, <laughs> but <laughs> the antagonist, is it a happy ending or how does it go? You guys want I think, I think you could say it's close to what we have tried to accomplish here, basically. It's basically what we're doing now here. It's, I see. we have our alternative mm. and we're spreading it basically. It's a happy ending, but the antagonist is not defeated yet. Well, <laughs> it may take a lot of time and effort and a lot of people to defeat the antagonist. <laughs> yeah. That. So basically it. it's the process, it, it's really a full circle. It's mm. us two. It's us kind of making a fun story where people learn by subterfuge some more, some different insights, which is what this community is familiar with. And at the end, the resolution is where we're at now. And that's all there is to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I'll tell you what, share again. We just have a few minutes left. Share again, all the various ways people can find the book and find you guys, right? Instagram, website, the name of the book, that, that stuff again, if you don't want. So maybe we've got that Instagram, Tigret and Lion Arts Dale. Mm, there's no end. Oh, uh, Tigret Lion Arts Dale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm which is basically the, the two characters that we are going to build our stories with. Mm -hmm. On that, there's a tap link, you know, you can press it in the bio and then that will give you direct access to uh, the Amazon uh, of your country. Nicole has been ever so kind as to create stickers that are free for people to use within the carnivore community. Can you find one while I... <laughs> yeah, stickers for the... Uh, so you can put them on your reels. You can, you can send them on apps. Instagram or on, on on WhatsApp. You can use them as stickers. Carnivore team. Is, is, stuff the book like that. is the book available digitally or is it only hard copy? How does that... It is not available digitally yet. Okay. That's something we were thinking about. You know, but I think for most little kids, they like the whole book. So although more and more kids are used to using tablets and poems and all that, I mean, it's... It just seems like a children's book should be something a kid can hold. That's exactly, skill. you're exactly right. My, my, my thinking was, to be honest, it's easier to, to get a, I think it's easier to get a margin on a, on a digital print. However, would I want a tablet for my child to show our roots? Not really. I, I think it's just nicer to have a real medium to sit down with than another screen. Okay. I found it. Yeah. Oh, there you go. You can see maybe. Some of Is the stickers. Is it showing? Yeah, you can see. Yeah, little pictures of the lions and, yeah, and stuff like that. It's a little basically, bit blurry, but that's basically, it. Okay. Yeah. 
you have one with more butter or carnivore heels, carnivore team. Mm -hmm. It's, it's okay. pretty fun. But there you go. And so otherwise the website is really to get in touch with us. Mm -hmm. And other than that is if you don't want to go through the Instagram, then you just have to type on Amazon, our species appropriate diet mm -hmm. and it should come up. All right. So info at Theo and hyphen Nicole.com would be possible and figure out your Instagram site, figure out mm -hmm. our tales mm -hmm. and <laughs> and, and that's, and that, that's like, <laughs> yeah, we're good. Thank you guys for being here and sharing. And maybe if I get into that, the Brittany neighborhood, I'll have to look you guys up. And I'd uh, be mad you if know, you didn't. <laughs> well, I will do my best. Like sometimes we're, I get a lot of people mad if I don't see it. And, and my, <laughs> my yeah. family, particularly, they want me to spend time. We'll be happy to take you around to show you Mont Saint Michel. <laughs> sure, I'd love to see <laughs> that. It'd be fun. Anyway, and thanks so much. Speaks. You guys have it. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> you guys have a wonderful evening and I'll tweet that out. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Take care.